Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's Sense of Feely Sparring Partners webinar on pioneering in building 5G spectrum and architecture. Our speakers today are Monica Paolini, Principal at Sense of Feely, Sharish Nagaraj, Chief Technologist of Wireless at Corning Optical Communications, and Art King, Director of Enterprise Services of Wireless at Corning Optical Communications. I'm Kendra Chamberlain, and I will be monitoring our webinar today. In Sparring Partners webinars, we watch our debaters discuss a topic live on video. We'd like to encourage our audience to participate in the conversation. Please share your comments and questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. All comments are visible to all participants, so please keep the conversation polite and respectful. Our speakers will do their best to address questions as they go along and as they become relevant to the topics being discussed, so please do not hold your questions until the end. And finally, we will be live tweeting today's webinar. You can follow along, participate in the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag sparring partners. And with that, I will hand it over to Monica. Kendra, thanks a lot, uh, thanks a lot for uh, uh, the introduction. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with uh, both Art, who is uh, a return guest. Uh, on Sparring Partner and Sharish, who is uh, a new guy, a new guy on the block. So, um, and we're going to have a, a good conversation. So, if you remember the first time uh, with Art, we talked about the enterprise, we had a sort of more general, um, a sort of higher level talk. Today, we're going to go and dig down a little bit more on the limiter wave for indoors. So, that's a really, um, it's a topic that gets people really you know, animated in discussing it. Does it work? Does it not work? Why do we need to do it? Or we absolutely need it. Um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of discussion. But what we're going to talk about today is not so much the discussion and do what you know should we do it or not, but actually what we are learning. So we're actually finally it's a, it's it's a great thing. We are at a point where we start seeing, you know, is it really working? Because even if we need it, we don't need it. If it doesn't work, what's the point? So today we're gonna go from the sort of high level, why do we need it? Why do we want it? Is it working? So it's gonna be more sort of hands-on and talk about what we are learning. And it's, it's a, it, I think it's, a, it's an excellent topic because it goes into like, what do we need indoors that we cannot do with the macro networks? Why do we need anything special? What's special about the indoors? And so before we get into that, I would like to, uh, for Shirish and Art to introduce themselves, uh, tell us what they do uh, at Corning, and then uh, we'll plunge on. And, uh, you know, as always, please do ask your questions at the beginning. We do not have a Q&A at the end. So go ahead, ask questions, and also ask, you know, add your comments Tell us what you think, uh, even if it's not a question, comments, and you can discuss among yourselves as well in the Q&A, not in the chat. Okay, so Shirish, over to you. Tell us. Hey, thanks, thanks, Monica. Thanks, Kendra. A pleasure to be here. Um, again, my name is Shirish Nagaraj. Uh, I'm the chief technologist for wireless uh, within Corning Optical Communications. So I'm responsible for um, the spec uh, architecture, uh, evolving the architecture of our wireless solutions, in-building solutions into 5G, and also leading the R&D, the technology development group here, based out of Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And Art, what about you? Um, Art King, I'm with the In-Building Network Technologies Group, and quite a, quite a bit of my role is involved in trying to connect enterprises to you know the value propositions and, and what we're doing. And just as an FYI, I'm the only doctor, only non-doctor in this conversation. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, never, I'm a network orderly. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's nice. That means that you didn't spend too much time on uh, at an educational institution. Yeah. You had time to do something more fun than we did. Anyway, okay. So okay, let's just get started. What's the what's special about in-building versus macro? Why can't we just have macros and be happy with it? Yeah, that's a great question, um, Monica. So I think uh, oftentimes, you know, what in-building is not, is is it's really not a scaled down macro. 
right? I mean, so many people, you know, if you think that, well, why can't I just deploy a macro just out of sheer size, power uh, considerations and so on, uh, those don't, those solutions don't fit. And what we have found is that you have to really architect in-building solutions from the ground up. So there's two philosophies, right? You can take it from a macro and sort of try to shoehorn in in-building. In that typically doesn't work. What we need is sort of a ground up design. And that's what we've done here at Corning. The, some of the key differences or, or challenges, if you will, come up in, uh, for example, the scaling of the radio. So, right. So if you have an in-building uh, system with, uh, you know, that has to cover 200,000 square feet, I mean, you need upwards of 20, 30 radios there to cover that, uh, depending on the coverage uh, area. And that can even scale up to hundreds of radios, depending on the size of the installation and so on. And so the system has to be inherently scalable. It's not just providing sort of three sectors of capacity and so on. So that's one key thing. The other thing that we have found is um, through sort of painful learning experiences that it has to be really thought of uh, to be a secure network from day one, right? So because in, in some uh, many instances, you may have a dedicated fiber you know, backhaul to the enterprise, but oftentimes you, know, you don't. And, and you are going over a public sort of ISP and, and, and that connecting back to the core, you have to think of this entire system as being secure, especially given that you don't have any physical security. You have all the radios hanging off of ceilings and so on, whereas in a macro, there's a physical security already implied there. So those are some of the key uh, differences. The other thing that we have found is that installation has to be really easy because these are all, you know, as, as you scale up in terms of deployment, so, uh, so the way we design radios is really has to be intelligent in the sense that they, they come up kind of blank. Um, they actually discover themselves. Uh, they, they connect to their parent, if you will, uh, uh, you know, authenticate. You know, it's almost like an entire, sec it's a full security protocol and then down download the software and so on. So those are some of the things. And the main thing that, that um, we have to remember is that you know, a macro is designed for specific challenges, right? Mob high mobility, high speed, you know, massive MIMO and all these sorts of things. Whereas in building, you know, the, the environment is a lot more benign. So you need to think about, you know, what really matters from a features point of view, like for example, SON and power optimization, these things are critical, but not some of this high mobility stuff and all that. So that changes the way you design and think about these networks as well. Yes, and I think it, what you said is really important. It's we shouldn't really think about an extension of the macro because that's where you're going to run into say, what do we need another macro? Where do we need to, you know? Now we're going to talk about five G, but before we do say what we think, we want to know what you guys uh, in the audience think. So let's go with the first poll uh, about this. Kendra, could you get get that going? Yes, our first poll, do we need a separate wireless infrastructure for IBW in 5G networks? Yes, more so than 5G, or yes, but just as much, or sorry, with 4G, but just as much as with 4G, or no. Yes, and we have our strong views on that. And, and I think that, you know, here, when we talk about 5G, we mean mid-band, the uh, uh, millimeter wave, and the whole set of it. Um, um, Monica, well, yeah. while people while people are voting, yes. um, I see a question from uh, William Flores around: um, Do you do, do you see a decline of active DAS? And in in fact, um, in the sub six gigahertz area, kind of the five G FR one, um, you know, we see the manufact manufacturers uh, such as ourselves certifying our technology to carry the five G uh, new radio signal. And there will continue to be a need to distribute, um, you know, multi-operator signals throughout buildings, you know, in, in, in the U.S. market and internationally. So it's, um, you know, DAS will continue to be relevant, and it's just it's just a continued evolution to be able to carry the 5G signal. And a lot of the older systems will probably have to be refreshed and redesigned for, um, you know, the, the C-band infrastructure as that comes online. Yeah, and in fact, um, on that point. Uh, you know, it's a great question, but like we will talk about some of the challenges in DAS as well uh, uh, later on. But, uh, you know, we see, we don't see it's one or the other in some sense, you know, you've got DAS deployments and they are good, great for neutral host. And then you've got, you know, with millimeter wave, typically there'll be overlay networks and those have to work seamlessly um, together. And that's how we are architecting the whole solution. Yeah, okay. Kendra, what, what, what do the audience say? Let's see. 
The results are 62% said we do need separate, separate wireless infrastructure more so than 4G. 23% said no, and 15% said yes, but just as much as with 4G. I would say that I, I agree with the audience, uh, uh, but what I would also add is that we already needed it with 4G. We just didn't, didn't get around to build it because when you look at it across the board, you know, it just like uh, 80 plus percent of our use is from indoor locations, not necessarily even enterprise home or, you know, whatever. Um, as much as we like to be outside, we spend most of our time, especially when we are connected. When we do things that require a lot of bandwidth, we are indoors. So that seems like, well, you know, in a way that's even more important than the outdoor network other than the fact that you need the mobility. So what do you guys think? Uh, do you agree with this? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, in fact, um, we, um, you know, we built uh, the whole 4G system uh, on that premise that, I mean, we call it an enterprise RAN. So that, that's mainly meant for in-building a network coverage and sort of dedicated capacity and so on. And, and we are seeing that now really ramp up in 5G. So there's been some significant um, differences that we have noticed going from 4G deployments to 5G where, you know, 4G deployments were more for in-building were considered more of a afterthought or as a coverage uh, extension or where there were problems and so on. Whereas with 5G, in-building is being thought of really from the get-go because all the enterprises and so on um, are, are sort of driving this. The use cases are driving it and also the spectrum. I mean, I think we'll come to that um, as well uh, in terms of the spectrum that uh, that we are trying to deploy is really needs an in-building in -building system. So what is special about 5G? What do we, is there any, you know, any difference there? Yeah, so um, I think if you can, maybe I have a slide to talk about sort of the deployments. If Kendra, you could just uh, put up the um, the first slide on that. So, I mean, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, we see is first of all, that there are obviously new, uh, uh, new spectrum and new uh, air interface technology being introduced with 5G. And clearly the, the big sort of disruptor is millimeter wave, right? And so there um, you can actually see that, you know, uh, the, the signals don't propagate indoor. And so clearly if you need that high capacity, high throughput, low latency sort of service um, in building, you have to have um, essentially um, uh, an, an in building network there for high band. Uh, so that's called FR2. Uh, on FR1, which is the sub six gigahertz band, um, again, we sort of distinguish it into two parts, sort of the more traditional cellular bands, which call it roughly sub three gigahertz, if you will, or sub two gigahertz. Um, and there, you know, LTE works, that's the workhorse and, and so on. But then there's all this new band that is coming up in C band, for example, or CBRS and C band. And that's where, again, in building networks will become extremely uh, important because that's the coverage and capacity play. Uh, where, where again, the signals don't propagate in building and, and you need um, uh, that to be covering for, for in building there. Um, so here, what we are showing, for example, is, you know, our architecture where, you know, you've got a, let's say an existing deployment of, of LTE radio nodes um, that are uh, sort of, you know, hanging off of a ceiling. And then what we can do is, and that's co connected in our architecture to a services node, a controller of sorts, right? And that talks to the macro in terms of handover and all that. And then we can actually augment that now with a layer of millimeter wave. So similar radio nodes that are actually doing capable of beam forming and so on that are shown in the picture there. Um, and, and they are talking to uh, an equivalent controller called as a centralized unit, right? So and this would be a virtualized entity and so on. And that's basically how you sort of overlay an existing 4G deployment to um, uh, with, a, with a 5G millimeter wave deployment. And as we go forward, as the industry evolves, I mean, we'll start doing standalone. Uh, so that's where 5G will be deployed by itself, talking to the next gen core and all that. And so this architecture will be ready for that uh, deployment. Yeah, actually there is, I see there is a question that is specific that I think since we're on this slide, it might be worth um, addressing that it's for the Corning One solution. When will it support CBRS and 5G and what will the max carrier aggregation capability look like and how many simultaneous users will have? 
Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Art, do you want to go? Or? Well, I was, I was just going to say, um, you know, cor the Corning One solution is a DAS, and um, the carrier aggregation is a feature more on the radio side. So there's we're talking like two two halves of the equation here. But um, go ahead, Shrich. Yeah. No. I mean the the. Uh, the DAS again, from a DAS perspective, we we support the bands um, and and we are evolving towards CBRS and C band as we speak. Um, but uh, uh, but also we are evolving to a digital architecture, and that's a big uh, shift as well as an active DAS that's far more efficient and so on. Uh, and again, like Art said, the carrier aggregation capability is again a base station capability, and that's the base stations driving it. But then from a bands perspective and uh, RF channels and so on, the the DAS will support. Yeah, so, you know, so that, let's just move and talk a little bit more about, you know, millimeter wave. Uh, there has been, uh, you know, some people, in, in, in fact, in the, in, in the UF, we're seeing a lot of millimeter waves outdoors. And uh, I think that is actually, the, the, the really, the, where millimeter wave shots is, in, is indoors, not outdoors, because the outdoors, obviously, you have a much more limited for access. Yeah. For transport is a different thing, but for access yeah. is clearly more of a challenge. Uh, but indoors, it's it's perfect because the the lack, uh, the, the the sort of the line of sight limitations is actually an advantage because you have better frequency reuse. I mean, clearly yeah, within reason. But yeah. but but the thing is that if you have something that goes throughout all the walls and everything, it's <laughs> not ideal. It's actually yeah. better. Yeah. To have the no, walls that actually do the work for you, do the, the, the RF planning for you, right? Yeah, no, absolutely, you're right. I mean, so what? I mean, we are seeing some of these trends that are actually, as we are learning, not only about the technology, but we are learning about how deployments are happening, and there's very big changes in terms of how 5G is being thought about uh, in terms of deployment compared to how 4G was. Again, 4G was uh, for in building was more like a point solution. Um, and in many cases, you know, with the low frequencies penetrating in building, it was, you know, not deemed necessary all the time. But with millimeter wave now, the use cases are driving uh, enterprise use cases mainly for all kinds of factory automation and what have you. Um, and then the other thing is, as you mentioned, the spectrum itself is locally contained, right? I mean, so you it, stuff doesn't come from outside in. And so you need a dedicated network uh, to actually uh, deploy this system. And so, um, and again, you know, it's quite interesting about how uh, you know the the sort of uh, standard way of thinking is that it only works in line of sight, and and we have been sort of pleasantly surprised, and I have some data that I can share later on uh, about the coverage of millimeter wave. You know, it's um, it's you know of course with there are penetration issues and so on, which it doesn't pass through walls and such and such, but the reflective properties is actually quite uh, quite significant, and that actually changes uh, the coverage quite significantly for the better. Yeah, and actually, I see I see somebody in the audience ask about the new uh, building codes, and actually, those are uh, uh, making in building wireless better and more necessary because with uh, the new building codes, it's more difficult for the signal to come in the building, so it's better. It's easier to reuse the spectrum, but also you need more in building infrastructure because macros cannot pen macro the, the signal for macros cannot penetrate. Yep. So. Correct. That's, that's not a 5G issue. It's like, um, yeah, no, absolutely. It's, well, it's, a, it's a cellular issue in general. I mean, w windows weren't only for, you know, light in the past. They were actually for radio signal too. And as, as they've layered on a molecular coating of tin or, you know, other metals onto the glass to keep the heat in the building, uh, you know, in the winter and you know, keep the keep the thermal load out in the summer, they've actually wiped out all the cellular signal into the building. So, you know, Indoors, where eighty percent is consumed, all of a sudden it's very important to actually have the the, the the cellular service indoors to satisfy the you know the subscribers. Yeah, oh, I, I saw some a question about using CBRS in millimeter wave. No way. Uh, there might be some spectrum sharing, but CBRS is only three point five, uh, three point seven gigahertz. So. One, one, one other question that's being asked here um, on, on cable infrastructure. Um, the enterprise is going through the evol same evolution that, uh, that the data center and telecom industries have gone where you finally get fiber to the edge of your infrastructure. In the data center, you don't find computers attached via copper. And with fiber to the home, fiber to the macro tower, um, you know, the, the really the enterprise is the final frontier to take fiber to the edge because you've got yep. link rates 
products that are so fast that um, you just overwhelm the capacity of copper. So, you know, this is a, a yet another evolution of, uh, of cabling infrastructure to take fiber all the way to the edge due to the need for, you know, a user data plane to you know, carry that much, uh, that much capacity. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, that uh, corning, I mean, there's uh, obvious synergy with respect to what we do in the fiber outside plant, as well as for inbuilding. And we have actually now, if you think about the two challenges, one is getting data to the edge, you know, high data rate, you know, to the edge. Um, and the other is getting power, right? So we actually have solutions which combine both of these sort of a remote powering solution that can go over a composite cable, as we call it, uh, an Actify cable, with the fiber delivering, uh, delivering the delivering the data, and 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 the copper delivering the power uh, into into um, into a radio, for example, an edge device. And this is something that we believe is future ready, right? So you do it once, you do it right, and then and then you're you're uh, you're set for your future. So it's a big part of uh, what we believe to be the right strategy for for 5G deployments. So from, from what you're seeing so far, where is the millimeter wave, you know, works? Is, does it work better in bigger building or something? Is there something that, or where it doesn't, you know, do you have, what, what, because yeah, in some cases it does. I mean, I've seen many demos mm -hmm. where it does, but in reality, yeah, what's, what's going on? So uh, in reality, I mean, there are, you know, obviously the, the types of deployments are very varied. So what we have seen is, you know, deployments in um, starting in very small uh, contained locations like retail stores and so on, where, you know, uh, we uh, service providers need to showcase millimeter wave and all that. And those are, of course, very contained deployments, right? And they work very well there, I mean, coverage wise and so on. And then what we have seen is also in uh, sort of typical enterprise offices, you know, uh, in offices and enter enterprise spaces. Um, where uh, you actually have to, uh, you know, really optimize the, uh, the the millimeter wave solution, depending on the type of deployment. Meaning that, for example, if you're ceiling mounted versus wall mounted. So if I have a ceiling here, which is just nine feet, you know, high or ten feet high or whatever, then that requires a different kind of beam design that will make sure that you have the entire coverage, right? Whereas if you have wall mounted, then you have to have um, other tricks where you have to provide some mechanical tilting as well as electrical tilting and so on to kind of make sure that the coverage is there. So it, it sort of works. I mean, we've seen this work in, you know, in, in our office here, we've got millimeter wave going on right now and we are testing all the time. Um, and, and then we are also seeing a lot of interest in, for example, stadiums and, and you know, uh, venues and so on, especially with stadiums. Um, it's, it's been quite interesting because, you know, you've got, let's say typically a DAS kind of a system that's deployed uh, along fed by a macro base station, but then people want to overlay it with a millimeter wave system and especially in the high profile areas and so on. So high capacity, um, you know, high throughput requirements, wherever they are and you know, millimeter wave works uh, perfectly fine. The interesting case is actually, you know, when you go to maybe more industrial environments and there actually we have found, you know, with, uh, with um, a lot of reflections, for example, uh, that, that actually the coverage is better than, than, than what we had expected just purely from out of our uh, prediction uh, tools, if you Actually, on that yeah. point, we can skip to uh, the fourth slide, I think, Kendra, if you don't mind, I can just quickly show that. Um, if, uh... No, the next, yeah. So this is, for example, uh, something out of our measurement uh, campaign that we did. It's uh, work that we've done with Corning Research in, in Corning, New York. And, and this is kind of a lab environment, but it's uh, it's got a lot of metal and so on. And so it's a reflective of a of maybe a shop floor or industry kind of environment. And we're doing a lot more now with, uh, you know, even our manufacturing plants and so on, where we can actually put millimeter wave and see the performance. And so what you see here is kind of a typical heat map from the coverage that we expect out of prediction. So if you take the 3GPP standard channel models and so on, um, that's what you would predict. All these, these white blobs here, these are kind of, you know, reflective surfaces or chambers and what have you, or pillars. And the radio is, is here. Um, and, and this is what you would have normally expected uh, a coverage uh, from millimeter wave. But what we instead find is that when you actually do the measurement, uh, that you do get a lot of coverage here. So for example, on the top right, where the coverage was not uh, being predicted, uh, we actually see a lot of coverage and, and that's coming from essentially reflections out of pillars and, and so on and so forth. So, so these are all things that we are actually learning uh, as we speak. So we are doing a lot of modeling. We are doing a lot of measurements. 
uh, combined with a research arm, and then sort of feeding it back into the planning tools as well. So it's been quite an interesting learning experience. Uh, I have a sort of practical question, and it seems like, okay, since Linus site is clearly a, a major issue, wouldn't you want to put most of your equipment on the ceiling so that Linus site is less of an issue? So you have less interruption, like somebody walks from the door and the signal goes off. Well, yeah, yeah, so, really tall, but whatever, you know? Yeah, so I mean, I think so, so ceilings definitely um, uh, would be a, a good, good place. First of all, they have to be below ceiling, typically. Yeah. Um, but but um, uh, but but the other thing is that when especially it's a short ceiling like you know typically in offices it does uh, uh, kind of pose a challenge because now if you think about it you need sort of a ubiquitous coverage you know sort of the whole uh, radiation to go out in this manner and that actually places constraints on the way you form your beam right so so you want to be making sure that your antenna array is capable of forming such beams and you have to design the beams very carefully such that you can actually cover it. So as you go higher in higher installations, that problem becomes easier. But then again, of course, you have the power power loss issues. But those are some of the challenges that you, you have to face, especially for ceiling deployment. So what that looks to me like, it's not like a Wi-Fi access point that you put wherever and then you forget about it. Uh, you just need to do, I mean, RF planning in you know, all this is going to be really crucial to make sure that you get the performance you want. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, RF planning is is very critical. I mean, in terms of deployment, um, what you don't have to worry about uh, anymore is sort of macro leakage and all that as much, which is a good thing. So you can actually design these systems in an isolated environment. But at the same time, the prediction is very sensitive, right? I mean, so you've got millimeter wave coverage is pretty much impacted by microscopic sort of changes, right? I mean, reflections, as I said, and so on. And those things weren't there, whereas with LTE and 3G and so on, the predictions would be reasonably accurate and all that. Here, it's quite challenging. I mean, so, so line of sight works well, but how do you actually account for all the reflections? What all do you model in terms of surfaces, materials? So we've been doing a lot of, um, you know, uh, materials kind of research as well to try to figure out, you know, what propagates and what doesn't propagate and how do you characterize that? So as I said, we do the measurements and then we actually feed that back into the to make the prediction tools better. But you're absolutely right; the prediction is is critical. Well, that's actually interesting because you know the the, the latest was like we need to look at the 3D infrastructure of the environment. It used to be on a macro, you just look at 2D and you're kind of good enough. Now you need to do 3D, and now we are in the next step. We also need to know what the material are because that's clearly important. That's I guess it's a, it's a really new a new diff, a new dimension for for the RF planning. Yeah. So that's uh, yeah. Um, that's great. Yeah, and, and we are constantly sort of thinking about, you know, uh, how to automate all of this, right? I mean, how do you actually build the intelligence into the system so that you can actually automate all of this, not only from the planning tools perspective, but also about how the system works, right? So for example, you can say that I, I'm going to have a certain fixed beam set of patterns and I keep that fixed forever, right? But that may not be the best option because, you, you know, you may have different blockages in different environments and all that. So how do you make the system to be sort of self-learning? And if you think about it in the 4G space, we were used to adapting power, right? I mean, that's the only thing that, that was the only degree of freedom, if you will, that we were adapting, you know, reduce coverage, increase coverage and so on. And now this becomes a multi-dimensional problem because now you can play in the beam space as well, right? So you can actually have, so we are uh, coming up with mechanisms where you can understand where the users are in terms of traffic, where it's getting generated, and automatically change your beams to sort of using sort of AI ML techniques to, to kind of aut automate that whole process, right? And so learn, evolve, and as traffic patterns change as well, it, the system has to evolve itself. And, and so that's that's going to be quite interesting and challenging at the same time. Yeah, and I guess you have the interaction of what the environment looks like, what the demand is like, what your equipment can do, and that's not fixed. That changes through yeah, time. So the RF planning is sort of like, step one because you need to know where your cabling and where Perfect. your equipment goes but then it's it's a sort of an, an ongoing work so it's yeah. um, much more interesting um now let's go um, because this was, one, yeah sorry, go ahead. One, one thing to add here um you know within the um, millimeter wave chip set there's something called a code book and um you know our, our our beautiful friends in san diego that provide our chips um 
uh, th th there's a there's a code book in there that's been developed by by Corning to to help figure out where the beams point, how much how many antennas you use, uh, uh, how much power you radiate, in order to really optimize the system. So not all systems are created equal, and you know Trish has led a huge R and D effort with 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 our with our people in New York and science and technology to really create a code book that is um, pretty stellar. And it's a competitive differentiator in the market. And once we start layering on AI and machine learning, so that that code book can can evolve, um, you know, it's 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 there's a lot of you know avenues of, of approach here that are opening up just with machine learning. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's going to be interesting to see how this develops because there's a lot of uh, differentiation there because we're all learning. I mean, in the industry, everybody's learning how to do this. And so that's where you do need differentiation. So on one hand, you do want to open interfaces and have a, you know, a, a more open ecosystem, but at the same time, you also need to be able to optimize what you need. And that's going to be specific to different vendors. Otherwise you're not, I mean, that's crucial to innovation to have yes. not only openness, but also different approaches and different solutions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So why don't we go to the next uh, uh, poll, which is uh, related to this. Um, uh, so Kendra, could you, could you go with that? Yes. Okay, this poll has two questions. The first question, how important is millimeter wave in, in building wireless? A, best frequency range and excellent capacity. B, valuable, but only as a complement to other bands, for example, mid-band or C, niche solutions for enterprises with high capacity needs, or D, not important at all. And our second question, 5G millimeter wave will be mostly used for A, outdoor access, B, in-building connectivity, C, fixed wireless access, or D, none of the above. Okay, so that's uh, two two questions for you for you guys and um and we have a lot of questions from the audience so we'll we'll, we'll get uh, uh, to them as well um there was one one question that was like you know why why do we need millimeter wave if we have cbrs and i think that uh, the answers to this one are going to start to address i think that uh, it's not like you don't need CBRS or uh, other indoor infrastructure. Um, I mean, uh, in, in different bands, it's it's a combination because the way I see it is that, and you, you tell me tell me what you think is that um, limiter wave basically can work as an offload for the other bands, in the sense that if I can capture all the traffic that I can, which is nearby the the equipment through millimeter waves that leaves much more capacity for other, for like CBRS that has a longer reach. So if I have uh, all the millimeter wave where there is a lot of people, then I can just have, you can just use CBRS to cover or to serve uh, uh, users that are farther away. Is that, is that yeah. logic, does that logic work or not? Yeah, it, it does. And, and uh, look, I mean, uh, it, Different um, service providers are diff taking different tack, obviously, in, 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 in this whole approach. But millimeter wave is thought of as, you know, it's not your sort of ubiquitous coverage um, thing, right? I mean, you will actually look for where you need that capacity and you actually deploy it. And that could be, in some cases, 80% of your deployment, 80% of your area and so on. And CBRS, of course, has, has a play, um, you know, it's just purely a private network, right? I mean, that's kind of where, you know, you directly can, enterprises can deploy this network by themselves and, and, and so on. And we have solutions for CBRS, both for small cells and, and, and for DAS. Um, but, um, you know, it's going to be a combination. And then C-band is as well coming, right? I mean, C-band is also another, you know, in the same range and has the same characteristics where you do need an in-building solution because it doesn't, you know, uh, propagate well from the outside. Um, but and it has high bandwidth, you know, enough bandwidth that you can actually serve, um, you know, meaningful use cases in 5G, and it has reasonable coverage. So it's it's it hits all the sweet spots, if you will, um, with that kind of CBRS and C-band coverage. Okay, why don't we go and see what the audience thinks about that? 
Okay, so for our first question, how important is millimeter wave in inbuilt and wireless? 42% uh, said valuable, but only as a complement to other bands such as mid band. 35% said a niche solution for enterprises with high capacity needs. 19% said best frequency range and excellent capacity. And 4% said not at all. And for our second question, 5G millimeter wave being used for 46% said in building connectivity, 31% said fixed wireless access, 21% said outdoor access, and 3% said none of the above. You know, that, I think that's, uh, if we would have run this poll like um, a year, a year and a half, a year or two years ago, I think we would have got different results. And it would be less, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's great to see because, you know, there were, initially there was a lot of skepticism about the limited way of working at all. And here we see that everybody is saying, well, there is a role for it. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I mean, we, um, I mean, there were, lots of opinions and, 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 and thought around and, and valid skepticism as well, right? I mean, you know, these things, it is, it is a flaky spectrum um, uh, for lack of a better word, but, uh, uh, but, but um, look, I mean, all the experiments and the industry has invested in this and uh, we have, I mean, a lot of people have focused on the outdoors and we right away being in building specialists, we, we right away thought that this is the right thing for in building where we need to showcase this. Uh, and provide the kind of capacity, and and some of the experiments are proving it right that that the coverage is you know is is not as trivial to say that oh it just only works in line of sight and doesn't work otherwise. Yeah, now um, we're gonna go to the questions from the audience, but I'm picking two and um, to to address the issue of virtualization and architecture. There is one about uh, uh, mesh networks uh, and the other one about centralizing the use, and I think that that's sort of like. They all point at the whole issue of okay, we have this in building network. How how is that structure? What is what what should we virtualize and what shouldn't we? Yeah. So we we talking more about the the access part, but what is what about the the, the sort of management? Yeah. So part? um well, I mean, it's the virtualization is coming into the access part as well. So um I actually have a a, a, a diagram to show uh, Kendra if you can bring up uh, maybe the. Uh, the second slide, I think it was um, about how, how we are sort of virtualizing this. So um, yeah, thanks. So here is uh, kind of uh, showing all the different types of topologies and architectures that, that you can um, actually deploy uh, a solution. So think about an office building. And of course, the radios are the physical devices. They have to be on premises. They have to be on the ceilings and walls and so on. Uh, but then now the question is, where's the rest of the infrastructure, the head end or the capacity source or, and so on. And typically, at least in the 4G world, for the most part, they were appliances, what we call boxes, basically. And there would be a box that would, you know, you would deploy and so on. Now there is a big shift, obviously, with, uh, with the push towards virtualization, where essentially the hardware layer is getting, in a way, commoditized. And as you know, you, we, operators want to deploy sort of COTS kind of uh, hardware based on general purpose processors, um, and then put on um, essentially orchestrated completely um, in a centralized manner uh, through their orchestration mechanism. So even software and so on. And, and what we as RAN vendors uh, become are really software providers, apart from the radio, of course. But for all of the rest of it, it's just we are software. We are providing a software that has to work with their orchestration platform. right? So there's a lot of integration challenges and work that has to be done. But essentially, from a location standpoint, the great thing about this is that it's truly flexible. So you can have, for example, if you think about an architecture where there's a millimeter wave radio that's talking to a centralized unit, right? So typically, earlier, that kind of a centralized unit or what we in the Corning architecture called the services node for 4G was a box, a pizza box that would you know, be on-premises typically. But with this kind of architecture, you can have a, a, an x86-based COTS uh, server sitting on the premise, which is virtually managed, I mean, remotely managed uh, by the operator orchestration engine. And then where we load our software into a central place and that sort of gets deployed onto that, uh, onto that server automatically. Or you can actually take that and put it uh, further away from the premises. So you can have, for example, here we can see in sort of a, the midso kind of an environment where you can have a CU located. Um, and, and that's typically geographically in some proximity uh, to a building. 
or you could have even in a hyperscaler kind of a data center kind of environment as well and all of these uh, solutions work as long as you have to make sure that the x2 especially for non stand alone the x2 connection between the 4g and 5g works right so you you architect it you network you you do the architecture correctly uh, from a connectivity standpoint uh, and the and the solution works the the thing that we are realizing more and more as you start to put it in a centralized cloud is how you think about uh, security right so so now it's it, it's in a way easier when when you have a, 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 a an appliance that you can think about security from uh, day one but in this model you've got a server platform coming from someone else a software coming from someone else and a network and and a transport network in the middle um you have to really think hard about you know where is you know what are the security implications how do you actually make the whole thing secure in an end to end manner so that's been a lot of ongoing work for for us frankly in this space yeah although i mean security is more of a question of finding the right solution because it's not any different i mean you know in in the macro you still have that kind of so i guess it's yeah. it's a question of having to we really want to make sure we think about it Yep. because as you said you know clearly for in building you have the additional issue that the equipment is much more reachable yeah i mean it could, physically yes. it's physically, yeah. physically. accessible yeah. so that is uh, uh you know uh, yeah i mean i mean all, the main thing is that it's it's a bit of um uh, just like with open ran and so on but but there is now multiple sort of players in the ecosystem right i mean there's the the hardware suppliers then there's creators and then people like us the rand vendors sort of we had all worked together to come up with a solution it's not a closed wall solution anymore right that that's what uh, takes some time and effort yeah 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 absolutely is there a, so we have a lot of questions from the audience we might not be able to get to all of them so if there is any that you would like to address uh, that would be good uh, there is one thing that i saw uh, so the, the the mesh um uh, solution uh is, is a mesh going to be applicable to like an in building uh network or it, do we need a mesh or um so so we it? haven't gone that direction but i mean you can imagine where you know you have essentially from a connectivity standpoint if you have a bunch of radios radio nodes or uh, in in the network you could have an environment where one of them is sort of the egress or ingress point and the others are and, and they're talking to the others uh, via mesh topology uh for at least for the ini initial deployments we haven't seen the need for that necessarily i mean we are sort of cabling it with fiber and power as i said um uh, and there's also other technologies coming to bear um uh, but this is probably more applicable outdoors such as you know uh, integrated access and backhaul and so on right i mean that's also coming in to solve the last mile problem but um at least for in building i mean you could envision it where the nodes are talking to each other again from a beam forming point of view and and how do you make those connections that would raise other other uh, concerns because um again like with millimeter wave you have to think about the directivity right so if you have you know made the solution such that it is providing access that doesn't mean necessarily that you can actually communicate with with a peer at the same level because you have to think about you know how do the signals get formed and you know pointing to the right directions and so on so you know building a mesh network is not just merely a matter of a software it's really also thinking the hardware through uh, correctly yeah now i'm going to put a bunch of questions together which has to do have to do with the um, uh the i guess the business model and the spectrum uh, uh, issues at the same time so the question is like, who is paying for this and is this going to be managed and operated by a network operator given that most of the the bands the millimeter waves that we're talking about are uh, is using license spectrum so it's not like wifi that you just deploy it or cbrs you need to have and actually i have to say that you know for uh, back to the question about cbrs cbrs would have been really perfect well so not just not cbrs but something some, some spectrum sharing would have been really good for millimeter wave because since you don't have interference between macro and in building you could see that you could actually share spectrum efficiently but it, it would have gone that way so you need to have a license so what does it mean that the enterprise has to work with an operator can they lease the spectrum how is that working or do you want to take that enterprise question or who pays yeah. for it yeah um uh, there's there's people that are doing um, spectrum leasing right now and uh, you know the the 
the issue is just availability of radios for, for the spectrum. And uh, I think, uh, you know, long term, um, there, there'll be enterprises that uh, run this themselves. Um, you know, in the, in, the, in, in the enterprise world, the closer a technology gets to the heartbeat of the operation, the more that IT wants to run it. So if I'm going to run millimeter wave and 5G uh, for a shop floor for manufacturing, um, as an IT person, I want to absolutely control that because when it goes down, I need to be able to get it up quickly so the line hasn't stopped. Um, so there's a concern that you know that you want to run this yourself. But if you're going to run, if it's a corporate carpeted floor for just employee connectivity, IT won't want to run that. And and it, it's because cellular is such a foreign country from a technology perspective to the enterprise. You know, it's um, the terminology and and the technology and everything about it is extremely different from, from what an enterprise normally encounters. And you almost have to hire specialist people to run these things if you want to really bring it in-house. And that, that doesn't seem to be a, uh, you know, a, a viable path for most enterprises. Yep. So, so do you see, how do you see the evolution of the role of the mobile operators in all this? Because as an enterprise, you can have control over the network, but you can have an operator running it for you. Mm -hmm. or somebody else, or you do it yourself. Um, yeah, there's, uh, you know, it's MSPs, 3PO's, um, operators, everyone is capable of running a, a private network, uh, you know, for, for an enterprise. It's, it's more the, uh, you know, who's going to provide the white glove service so that, uh, you know, if you're running a manufacturing operation that, you know, you're, you're going to, you know, be okay from an operations perspective. So it's really, um, you know, I believe that the operators are going to enter, you know, a lot of the private uh, private LTE and private 5G arena and be able to provide these services. And it's really the getting getting from from a support perspective, getting to the consciousness and, and well connected with the actual demands of the enterprise around availability and agility of the service to you know satisfy their business needs. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Um, actually, maybe we should go with the think, third. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think there was a question around about the centralized DU. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I quickly touch on that. Uh, so typically, the way we think about a DU, so um, in in a in a millimeter wave uh, radio, for example, that is a DU and an RU integrated. That's in physically in the hardware. But if you have a virtualized DU, uh, and we believe this is makes more sense in the more traditional bands as well as in in C band, for example. Um, typically, these would be on premises. I mean, you have a very strict timing requirements and latency requirements there. So typically we envision them to be on-premises. You could have it in a centralized place, but then you need to make sure that the network that's connected to it is actually highly you know, optimized and it's have a dedicated uh, connection. And so but, but the typical model of deployment that we are seeing is that you know this would be a server on-prem where you run, run the DU. So, so you would have the, the, the DUs in the building or and then the CU could be farther yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the CU, for example, can, you know, once it's centralized, truly centralized in an operator cloud or, you know, and so on, uh, it would actually serve uh, multiple enterprises. You know, it can serve radios from yeah. you know, Office X or another uh, enterprise Y and so on. And so that actually gives you scale as well. I mean, you can actually architect it for cloud native principles and so on. Um, whereas, so, whereas the DU requires a lot of real-time constraints, right? I mean, it's all signal processing at, at a high level. You've got to make sure that you don't mit, miss your um, TTI ticks and so on. And, and you've got to really architect it for a different kind of an application. So it makes sense to keep it easier by being, being on-prem. Now, the, with, with, the, with respect to the open RAN, I know oftentimes open RAN is it's a little bit difficult to uh, deploy if you're a, a brownfield operator, you already have the network, you have a lot of late, uh, legacy, but it seems like for in building enterprise networks, that seems like it, that, that should be easy because they, they're starting right now. So it's yep. a basically greenfield oper um, a network. Uh, yeah, and so why not using open RAN? Yeah, I think, um, and, and this is a great question. I mean, open RAN is kind of, um, in our view, makes a lot of sense, especially when you start looking at, as I said, the mid-band spectrum. Um, and again, you know, there, and fundamentally coming from the, the throughput and the latency requirements that, that you have on the front hall network, otherwise, right, for millimeter waves is kind of prohibitive. 
Um, and and there, uh, you know, what we have to take into account, the first thing that I said about a difference between, you know, macro network and in-building, right, is the scalability. So you've got a lot of radios that may not be active all the time. I mean, we have lots of data about the activity factor and, and the load that is there. So you've got to have a DU that is truly scalable. And so once you have that, and, and being able to share the resources very well, right? So you have, get all the stat, stat marks gains, if you will. And then and then over the same sort of fiber link, you can actually talk to multiple radios and scale up um, in that manner. And, and that's going to be the challenge because otherwise if, you, if your DU is not efficient and you have to bring multiple servers, then at that point, the cost starts to get um, really prohibitive. So you got to think about it from a different angle uh, when you talk about in-building networks, especially when you want to virtualize the DU. Yeah, and I, and I guess sort of that point that you made at the very beginning that we need to think about in buildings, in building networks, not as a sort of a smaller macro. It's just a completely different proposition. And if they serve the enterprise rather than uh, of being part of a public network, that's yeah. also a, a diff. I mean, yeah. that, that drives a different type of requirements and different. Yeah. Solution. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, you know, when we designed the millimeter wave radio, uh, I mean, I mean, we talk about software and software is challenging. There's no question about it, but it's a huge hardware challenge as well. So we had to really think of it from the ground up about a, what are the requirements? It needs to be aesthetically pleasing. It needs to be small form factor, low power consumption. And hey, by the way, also do multi gigabit per second and low latency, right? So you, you start adding all of these things in, it starts to become quite uh, quite challenging. In fact, I can show you the radio that we have, the millimeter wave radio, I don't know if you can see this. Um, so this is a really small form factor and we have actually designed thermally these fins to be tr sort of truly, you know, optimize it for, uh, for a look and feel. So these actually, when you place them up, you know, in, in a ceiling, you can hardly see the fins and so on. So it's really very uh, designed from aesthetic principles as well. And we have spent a lot of time uh, trying to do thermal management as well. So, so think about, you know, first of all, you have to deliver, or you, can, you can deliver only a certain amount of power. So you have to stay within that power budget. And then, and then within that, how do you dissipate it in a passive way, right? So then you got to think about, okay, what happens when things start heating up or the environment starts heating up? What do you do? I mean, and then the software intelligence comes into play and all that. So there's a lot of, I would say, very close hardware and software collaboration you know, the hardware can't be designed and then the software just gets stacked on. These two have to be designed together. And that's what you've done. And so it's been a great ride uh, just working through all of these challenges because, you know, uh, as uh, you know, it's not a, it's physics, I guess, but, uh, you know, we are trying to radiate a certain amount of power. You're going to push all this bandwidth. The CPUs are running constantly hot and all that. Uh, it tends to be quite a challenge. Yeah. Monica, when you think when you think about the uh, in, in interior temperatures of office buildings, um, you don't think about the weekends normally because you're you, you're never there. But you know, in the past for electricity management, you turn off the air conditioning and let the building heat up on the weekend. And on Sunday night, about two a.m., you flip on the AC again and cool it down for people for when people arrive on Monday. So you know we have to you know we have to live within uh, you know a, a temperature range that's um, surprisingly large, uh, mainly because the buildings can actually vary in temperature a lot internally, even in a normal production building situation. Yeah, and, 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 and if, if you think about like uh, some industrial environments, well, you might you might have a temp whatever range of temperature maybe much higher or lower. Yes. Uh, there might be some vibrations. I mean, there's all sorts of yeah. issues. And the thing well, is and that the, the, the visual part becomes much more important because you have so much of it. So much of, I mean, in general, wireless infrastructure that you don't want your offices to look really ugly. And, you know, it, 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 it might sound like a, a detail, but it, it is important. So, you know, like yeah. your it looks look sort of like a, a light light fixture, you know, yeah. it's, it, it really helps because you don't want to have, you know, yeah. next year. I mean, you really want it to sort of meld into yeah. the, yeah. You, you want it to meld into the, into the background, if you will, and sort of not, not be sticking out like a sore thumb, if you will. Um, and, and in fact, the other thing that Art mentioned, I want to just stress on that is that, you know, as we go, just like with light, mm -hmm. lights, ele electricity, things are, you know, you conserve power, with these 5G networks, I mean, each of these radios are now taking, you know, 
three fold, four fold amount of power than a typical radio radio of LT would. So, it, uh, you know, power uh, efficiency and sort of energy efficiency is also a key thing. I mean, to drive down, you know, the operating costs as well as to be green and so on. So we have also taken a lot of effort to try to figure out how do you actually adaptively figure out when do you really need to transmit and not and all that. So just like how the you know phones do the, you know power management and so on, we have to think about that in in, in sponsors as well um, and in the head end yeah. equipment. Maybe you can turn it off here yeah. and along with the AC. Uh, <clears throat> now let me um, uh, let let's do the final poll before we uh, wrap up. So Kendra, could you could you? Yes, our last poll, will millimeter wave be most frequently used in A, stadiums and other entertainment venues, B, public high density areas, C, high traffic enterprise locations, or D, none of the above? Okay, so as we go, there is a question about coexistence of Wi-Fi 6 and sub-6, I think five, six, uh, sub-6 5G we addressed. Uh, Wi-Fi is not going to go away anytime soon. We're actually going to have a sparing partners specifically on Wi-Fi um, in about a month, uh, so it will be announced. Uh, but clearly, I, I think that the, the, the way to look at this is that there is no single frequency ban or solution. We just need to have multiple ones, and so uh, be, because the needs are so diverse. And not everybody, not every enterprise will need the limiter wave or even in building. So it really, it's like, the question is to understand what is that an enterprise needs. So, so Monica, yeah. um, we've, we just did a, a webinar on something called, the, conceptually what we're talking about is universal wireless where buildings have both Wi-Fi and cellular. And what it does is it allows an evolution where the enterprises can completely disconnect from any kind of cabling and go 100% wireless. And, uh, and you need both technologies because you got a ton of laptops with Wi-Fi and you got a ton of people on mobile. And the, the IT cost to take all the mobile devices onto Wi-Fi and handle all the uh, business users' issues and stuff is so high that you know, it makes more sense to keep it on, a, on, on cellular. So we see them as companion technologies to fully satisfy the user, but more importantly, take enterprises 100% wireless and get rid of a huge amount of operations expense around uh, a lot of the horizontal uh, uh, cabling infrastructure, the network switches in the closets and the expense there, all the electricity required to run all the equipment. You know, going 100% wireless challenges uh, an 80 year old design template that we use to build office buildings right now and network them. It's, um, it's a really huge sea change that is very quietly going on right now. Yes, and I think yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, oftentimes, you, you know, people say, well, you know, is it uh, uh, cellular versus wireless as if they are the two terms, but really it's like wireless versus wireline. And you always need wireline, you always need fiber. So it's not like it's going away, but for access to get to the, to the terminal device, it's just right. going to be wireless because now we can do that. Right. And, and it just, that, that, that's the cost savings is actually there more than the Wi-Fi versus 5G. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, I used to pull, you know, three cat fives to each cubicle at three and twenty five, three hundred twenty five dollars per pull. So a thousand dollars in cable per cubicle. Um, all of a sudden is eliminated, you know, and, and the new building that we just built, uh, we're eating our own dog food and, you know, 800 people. 800 workspaces that uh, are just all wireless. It's a, it's a, just a, a tremendous change in, in, in the uh, CapEx and OpEx for the, for the building itself. You can't even afford an $800 5G phone. <laughs> okay, how do you say that? <laughs> okay, let, let, let's see what, uh, what uh, the audience uh, says about this. Okay, so for where millimeter wave will be used most frequently, 46% said public high density areas, 30% said high traffic enterprise locations, 21% said stadiums and other entertainment venues, and 2% said none of the above. This is a case where I actually would have said more like uh, enterprise locations myself, but 
what do you guys what would you have said yeah no i think um, i mean i i actually when the poll went up i thought you know there should have been an option for all of the above but <laughs> but uh, but we do i mean yeah there there are um, uh, you know clearly you know it, it really depends on the use cases again right i mean so enterprises uh, you have to you know this thing will enable new use cases that will you know uh, either with ar vr and so on and and uh, and such that that is one thing the other is sort of in even in industrial automation i mean we are seeing a lot of activity around industrial automation video analytics and so on and then of course in stadiums and uh, 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 you know high profile public venues i mean these are there i mean the people are there you know yeah. you have got the yeah. capacity the, the density and so on so in a way i see all of them sort of play out uh, in in per millimeter way. okay i think we are at the top of the hour so we could go on for quite some more longer time but we need to let people go on with their lives and do it too so uh I would like to thank you guys uh, a lot, uh, Sharish, Art, and everybody in the audience. And uh, I would hand it over to Kendra. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. This will conclude our webinar for today. A video recording and a podcast version of today's conversation will be available at the senseofphilia.com website in the coming days. And we have two upcoming sparring partners that we would love to see you at. The next one, which will be May 6th, is Analyst Chew the Fat. This is a kind of special sparring partners um, where Monica and other industry analysts will be discussing relations within the wireless community, looking at analysts and analyst relation teams and then what they can learn from each other. And the sign up for that webinar will be on the senseofphilia.com website. And then our second upcoming webinar will be on CBRS, 5G, and Terragraph and Wi Fi. And that will be May 13th. And registration for that will also be up on the senseofphilia.com website. Thanks again to everyone and our speakers today for that great conversation. And we will see you at future events. Thank, Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Kendra. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.